In the upcoming reboot, Red Sonja will get to keep her iconic chainmail bikini, but her origin story will be replaced with a new one. These news have been met with a mixed response, which I understand, because at the surface level, that doesn't sound good. But peel away the layers and put this into its proper context, and you'll find that of all the would-be Red Sonja movies that have been in various stages of development over the past decade, the one with the best potential to actually be good is the one in production right now from director MJ Bassett. Nowhere on the internet has the development of this movie been documented as comprehensively as right here on Midnight's Edge, so let's put things into context. In this editorial, I will be breaking down all the most recent news about the movie we are getting, and compare that with the movie we almost got, explore why changing the origin story isn't as big a deal as you might think, before going through the one major red flag that still persists. On January 11th, The Hollywood Reporter released a feature article titled Breaking the Curse of Red Sonja, providing more information on the upcoming reboot. From here, the information seeped into many other outlets, all with different angles on it, but this is the source article for all of them, so let's dissect what they have to say. After a lengthy intro, we get an approximation of the movie's budget. With a budget somewhere in the mid-teens, Red Sonja is a lo-fi attempt to garner a box office hit for Lerner's Millennium Films. So, mid-teens budget, good. A sword and sorcery movie doesn't need more than that. This tells me it will be grounded, as it should be. Also, such a low budget increases the chances the movie can be profitable, even with an R rating, so the door is left open for that. After a brief retelling on some of the select previous iterations of the movie, we learn that the main producer overseeing this is Yariv Lerner, the son of Avi Lerner, and not Avi himself. Only time will tell if this is good or bad, but I will say it rhymes a bit with the original Conan the Barbarian, where Mogul Dino De Laurentiis gave the daily producerial tasks to his daughter Rafaela, and nepotism aside, Rafaela nailed it. Fingers crossed Yariv can do the same. Let's now jump from producer to director, namely MJ Bassett. Let's begin with the elephant in the room, because it is prominently featured in the article. MJ Bassett was born as Michael Bassett, and is a trans woman. Now, that may cause some to pause, but don't pause just yet. When MJ Bassett was first announced, I maintained that this was the best thing ever to happen to the production, and that Bassett, the director of both Solomon Kane, the surprisingly good Jack Reacher on Amazon, and other badassery, is the perfect fit for Red Sonja. After having read this article, I stand by everything I said in that video. Bassett details growing up with the movies of Wes Craven, Sam Raimi, and Alien and the Exorcist as main cinematic influences, which is a good starting point for any filmmaker, especially of genre movies. Ever since the early teens, however, the young Michael Bassett felt trapped in the wrong body, suffering what the article describes as gender dysphoria. The article describes how Bassett chose to sublimate it, but felt a grinding sense of not being quite right. Publicly, Bassett went the other way, becoming an overly confident alpha male, leaving school at age 15 to become the assistant to a wildlife filmmaker and drifting into conservation, climate change and alternative energies. And finally, towards filmmaking, most notably with the excellent Solomon Kane among other badassery like Death Watch, Ash vs. Evil Dead, Altered Carbon, Reacher, and even the Terminal List with Chris Pratt. Stuff like that is what MJ Bassett stands for as a director. Privately though, Bassett lived a secret life, with a wife and three children knowing nothing about the fear of dying in the wrong body without ever having really lived. Bassett then came out as trans in 2017, and while this obviously changed some interpersonal dynamics, Bassett did manage to hold on to the relationship to the closest family, with one daughter even working as a stylist on the Red Sonja movie. 
But does all of this mean that Bassett is now a gender activist? Not as such, no. Bassett worked on both Reacher and The Kill List after transitioning, and there was no trace of any activism there. The article also says that Bassett refuses to adopt many of the tenets of trans advocacy, hasn't disavowed J.K. Rowling, and retains fond memories of reading the Harry Potter books to the kids. Bassett is also of the opinion that mammalian biology is strictly divided into male and female, and that it's nonsensical not to have biological woman as part of your vocabulary. If you want to see MJ Bassett roll the eyes, use a term like non-menstruating humans. In other words, Bassett being trans privately has no bearing on Bassett as a filmmaker, which is also made clear by the article. With Red Sonja, Bassett wanted to steer clear of the obvious identity politics that audiences might expect be brought to the table when telling a story about a female hero imprisoned by misogynistic portrayals for decades. Instead, Bassett wants Sonia's journey to be an allegory for more existential questions around the survival of the species in the face of climate change. I will admit that the whole survival of the species in the face of climate change angle is a potential red flag. For the record, I do not deny that climate change is real, nor do I deny that a significant chunk of it is caused by human intervention. That this climate change will supposedly cause humans to go extinct this century, though, that's another matter. So if Red Sonia starts ranting about windmills or throwing paint at artwork to stop oil drilling, yeah, then I'm gonna roll my eyes. But there is an easy out here. You see, the adventures of Red Sonia take place during the fictional Hyborian Age, which was roughly 12,000 years ago, which places it right around the very real Younger Dryas, which the followers of Graham Hancock will know very well. That was a time of pretty extensive climate change, we know this from the geological record. And better still, even Robert E. Howard himself described the Hyborian Age as essentially a blip in history, surrounded by cataclysm and climate change in both ends. What that means is that depending on how you do it, a Red Sonja movie can feature climate change and be 100% true to the source material. I would think Bassett is smart enough and familiar enough with the source material to know this. The reason I think it is phrased this way then, and why Bassett is portrayed as something of an activist, only of the environmental kind, I think is to throw a bone to the entertainment media complex. Because MJ Bassett is not making the Red Sonja movie that Hollywood wanted. Prior to MJ Bassett, Red Sonja was on track to be directed by a trans man, namely Joey Soloway, and written by Tasha Huo. And, as suspected, we now know that that iteration of the movie was all about identity politics. We've covered this before. To briefly recap though, Joey Soloway, which is a gender fluidity activist through and through, was not about to allow Red Sonja to actually be a redhead. Oh no 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 no. Red Sonja had to be black, and so Joey Soloway cast Hannah John Kamen as Red Sonja, to great cheers from the entertainment media complex. Furthermore, Soloway would reportedly have none of the deeply problematic male gaze, so Hannah John Kamen's Red Sonja was rumored to be covered up in Galadriel-style armor, so her Red Sonja probably would have looked a lot like her ghost in Ant-Man and the Wasp. As for the activism, I have heard what I stress are unconfirmed rumors, but rumors nonetheless that the movie was set to be so inclusive that heteronormativity, men in general and straight white men in particular, were treated as evil and aberrations. Joey Soloway's iteration of the movie likely would have been fully embraced by the entertainment media complex and soundly rejected by the fans and movie-going audience. Luckily, this iteration of the movie fell apart one year ago. This was also mentioned in the Hollywood Reporter article. A complete disaster, said one crew member with knowledge of Soloway's involvement. 
They just didn't feel competent to do the movie, says Yarib of Soloway, who nevertheless remains attached as an executive producer. Soloway has a different explanation for the change of the role, but it's such a stupid one that even the Hollywood Reporter put it in parentheses, and I'm not even gonna dignify it by reading it out loud. Anyway, it was in the aftermath of Soloway's iteration of the movie falling apart that M.J. Bassett, who did grow up with the Red Sonja comics, became involved. Bassett cast Matilda Lutz in the role. Bassett insisted the chainmail bikini be present. After learning this, I still had one lingering fear, which I addressed in the previous video, namely that they were still seemingly using Soloway's script. Luckily, Bassett addressed this to The Hollywood Reporter. Bassett's script steers clear of sexual politics and gender. Curious and friendly in person, Bassett also is direct. I didn't warm to the previous script, which was much more sexual politics. Obviously, in my personal life, I'm interested in that, but as a storyteller, I don't think it's interesting. That, I think, is what many needed to hear. But there was also something else some would rather not have heard. But here, I have to be really careful with how I word myself due to this platform's censor bots. Bassett also eliminated a key plot point from the original 1985 film, Sonia's Grape by marauding enemies, saying, I have no interest in fictional women who use grape as an engine of motivation. It's not a strong motivation. She's just a human being in the world of femininity. Let's explore that further. When Red Sonja first appeared in the pages of Conan, she had no origin story. She was just a badass swordswoman. It wasn't until a couple of years and several appearances later that she was retroactively provided with one. So keep that in mind. Red Sonja wasn't written with any origin story. It was retconned in later, and later still, retconned away. But getting back to this fleeting origin, at age 21, Red Sonja's family was killed by roaming marauders who also, shall we say, had their way with Sonja without securing consent first. In the aftermath of this, a goddess came down from the sky to give her magic sword-wielding powers, in exchange for her never being able to get down with another man, lest he best her in combat first. I always thought this diminished the character, because it meant she never had to work for her fighting ability. She was literally magicked into an undefeatable Marisu. Furthermore, while I never read Joey Soloway's script myself, I did hear, again, unsubstantiated rumors that the unrequested gangbang was present there and formed an important part of the would-be movie's anti-male and anti-heteronormative messaging. In other words, that particular origin story is not a hill I will die defending, nor do I think anyone else should. All told, I am even more convinced that this could end up a really solid Red Sonja movie, one that will please the fans. Case in point, my impression is that the whole purpose of this article is to highlight to the entertainment media complex that even if this won't be the subversive woke fest they would have liked, the director is a trans woman, and there is an environmental message, so please back off and don't trash the movie for starring a white redhead in a chainmail bikini. There is one thing that still worries me though. The reason I was instantly sold on MJ Bassett as director is Solomon Kane. There, the investors demanded an origin story for the first movie, and Bassett was able to conjure one up which worked, didn't lessen the character, set the stage for later literal adaptations, and which was a fine movie in its own right. Sadly, it never got any of the planned sequels, because it never got a distribution deal in the US that included a wide theatrical release. Because of that, it never earned enough to secure sequels, which was the most tragic loss of a franchise up until Dread. Well, this Hollywood Reporter piece reads, and it's unclear when anyone will get to see it, given that the movie still lacks a US distributor. I don't like the sound of that. 
Here's to hoping that this article will spur enough interest, leading someone who can give it a proper release, which opens the door to sequels, to pick it up. That aside, now that you've heard all of this, where do you stand on the movie? Let me know in the comments.